we get a few more people to join. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this new edition of EV characterization series hosted by SNEV. Thank you for joining. Today we have amongst us Dr. Estefania Lozano Andres. I'm Ayush Panda from National Institute of Science, Education and Research, India, and I'll be moderating this event together with Carlos Jesus from University of Coimbra, Portugal. So I'll quickly go through and introduce, uh, go through the bio of uh, Dr. Estefania Lozano Andres and introduce her to our audience today. Estefania accomplished her molecular biology degree at the University of Alcala de Henares in 2014, where she did her thesis work on the immunodiagnosis of hematological malignancies by multiparametric flow cytometry. Next, she completed her Master of Science in Immunology at the University of Madrid, with her thesis focused on the analysis of immune uh, system by uh, multiparametric flow cytometry. Uh, in 2016, Estefania joined the lamp of Dr. Maria Yanez Mo at the University of Madrid, where she started her work on extracellular vesicles. Fascinated by the potential of using single particle flow cytometry to investigate EVs, Estefania moved to the Netherlands to continue her PhD at Utrecht University within the innovative training network in extracellular vesicles, that is train EV. Since 2018, her work is focused on the analysis of EVs by flow cytometry to exploit several applications, including liquid biopsy, biomarker profiling, and standardization. Her research has been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, Cytometry Part A, and Nanomedicine. Currently, Estefania is a researcher at the Utrecht University, where she heads the Center for Flow Cytometry and continues to share her passion for flow cytometry and extracellular vesicles. Um, I will request the audience to keep their questions in the chat box. We'll be reading them at the end. And I think the stage is all set for Estefania to take up. Thank you so much. Uh, I will share my screen now. Yeah, sure. Let me see. All right. I think with this, you should be able to see my presentation, right? Yes. Perfect. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. And um, yeah, I'm extremely happy for the invitation to give this talk. I always love to, love to talk about uh, flow cytometry and EVs. And uh, I think uh, SNEF is doing really a great job uh, with all these uh, special editions and, and talk series. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how to navigate challenges and unleash opportunities in EV flow cytometry. And for that, I would like to start by acknowledging some of the great challenges uh, that we have in the uh, flows in the EV uh, field, uh, okay, yeah, um, because we want to unravel the pathophysiological role of EVs, and for that we would like to characterize and isolate EV subsets from the heterogeneous biological pool, uh, but we also want to exploit a therapeutic application for which we need to do controlled large-scale preparation and isolation of clinical grade EVs, um, and also we need to have in control, in uh, place a lot of quality control um, procedures for these uh, EVs. And uh, lastly, we also want to uh, use EVs as biomarkers, which is a topic that I'm also especially interested uh, in. And for this, we also want to um, measure EVs directly in biofluids. Uh, for that, we also need to consider that the biomarker that we are looking for in a specific EV might only be a rare subset from the, the full amount of uh, EVs that we might have in that biofluid. So all in all, um, let me see. Yeah, there is a need for a technology that is capable of measuring single EVs in a high throughput manner. 
And why using flow cytometry to measure EVs? Um, well, flow cytometers uh, have been used to measure single particles cells mostly for decades, and they are very powerful platforms. Uh, they are widely available in a lot of clinical labs. They are used for routine and uh, diagnose and, and prognose of diseases. They are very sensitive and also very robust. And very importantly, they allowed for a high throughput uh, analysis. And uh, it's also possible to automate these uh, measurements. Um, so these are all very good reasons, I think. Uh, but on top of that, we also have the fact that they allow for both quantitative and qualitative analysis of particles. We can count uh, events, we can provide concentration measurements, um, but we can also um, unravel the content, the biomolecular content of a specific um, a particle. We can look at fluorescent proteins, we can use antibodies that are conjugated to fluorophores for detection, and there are a lot of dyes in the market that will allow us to look at nucleic acids, carbohydrates, lipids, enzymes, etc. This technology has been um, available for a long time now, but it's also uh, still um, being developed in a way. So a lot of these reagents and resources are becoming more and more available. However, there are some specific challenges if we want to analyze individual EVs by flow cytometry. And the first thing that a lot of people uh, realize is the size of the EVs. They are much smaller compared to cells. Um, but they are also very heterogeneous, and we don't have a universal, unique EV marker that we have found and could make our lives a lot easier yet. Um, and on top of that, we also uh, have to acknowledge that there are overlapping biophysical properties with other non-EV particles in the preparations. So how flow cytometer uh, looks, uh, it will depend highly on the instrument that you have access to. Maybe you can recognize some of these uh, pictures. You might have access to some of these instruments in your labs, or maybe you have access to a flow core facility in your institutions. Um, there are a wide vari variety of different machines um, in the market. And we typically see a box in which a lot of things are happening. Uh, we put our samples in there and then we get uh, a lot of results that we hope to make sense of. Um, flow cytometry indeed allows uh, for the multi-parametric analysis of particles in a suspension. And when I see these instruments, I don't really see a box, but I see a lot of the things that are happening inside. And then you can see in this very simple uh, scheme, and this is uh, very important, in my opinion, to understand what are the things that are happening inside the instruments. Because for EV flow cytometry, uh, this type of technical knowledge is even more important than when you're doing cell flow cytometry. So we have, uh, let me see if I can get the pointer. So we have our particles in a suspension. Um, and they will be interrogated one by one. This uh, suspension is also part of the fluidics component of the instruments. But we also have an optical component that includes the lasers that will hit these particles one by one, but also the uh, combination of uh, filters um, and mirrors that will collect all the signals and uh, the signals will be finally processed in the electronics of the instrument. And then we have it connected to a computer in which we will be able to visualize uh, our data. So if we zoom in a little bit more in this part of the picture, then we will see a stream in which the cells are gonna be um, interrogated one by one. Uh, 
uh, then the, the laser in most cases is a 488 nanometer uh, laser will hit these particles and they will uh, generate light scattering signals that can go in the forward but also in the side direction and if we have the markers, the antibodies or generic membrane dyes, for example, we will also be able to collect this fluorescence. So all these signals are processed and then we typically get a dot plot in which uh, we can see uh, the different uh, uh, signals for those events. In conventional flow cytometry, we can see differences in side and forward scatter. We typically see that cells that are more uh, complex and bigger in size tend to be higher in this plot and cells uh, that are um, smaller and um, with a less uh, um, complexity, they tend to appear lower. And we can also see some debris signals in the, in the corners. Um, in most cases, for uh, cell flow cytometry, the detection depends on this amount of uh, uh, light scattering that is collected in the forward direction. But for EVs um, that are a lot smaller and have a much lower refractive index, we have to consider that the amount of scattering light is going to be much lower than cells. And this makes a really big di um, uh, difference in how we are going to um, this define our detection strategy. If you want to read more about the basis of flow cytometry, I can uh, yeah I can only recommend uh, I can only recommend this book. This really great uh, book um, with a lot of uh, um, information on this. And uh, what are the the problems or the challenges that we face when we are measuring EVs by flow cytometry? Well, like I said, flow cytometers are designed to measure cells. And when we want to measure EVs, they lack the sensitivity for single EV analysis. Uh, because they are small and EVs are also dim, the detection limit of conventional instruments is around 200 nanometer for polystyrene beads, which have a much higher refractive index than EVs and therefore scatter also a lot more light. Um, but also because there are overlapping properties between EVs and non-EV particles, so there might be some labeling artifacts, and this lack of sensitivity can also lead to even more artifacts. So there is something known as swarm detection, which is a mass massive coincidence of particles, and I will explain in a few slides, which is a very well-known uh, yeah, artifact in EV flow cytometry, but the good news is that it's very easy to control for it. So for EV uh, flow cytometry, we want to improve the sensitivity of the instruments. And in our lab, we worked a lot with uh, BD Influx, which is a high-end open architecture uh, flow cytometer. You can see it in this picture. And we did a lot of modifications to, uh, to make it more sensitive. If you want to know all the technical details, those two manuscripts uh, here are very uh, informative and they contain a lot of information on all the optimizations uh, that were done. Some of them can be here, uh, can are here in this um, slide. And um, yeah, basically we have a high power lasers. We also have an adapted small particle detector. We use a reduced wide angle uh, forward um, detection and uh, low shield and sample pressure. So we can maximize the amount of time that a particle is spent in this interrogation spot um, and so on. And uh, before I continue now, I want to explain a little bit of how signals are being processed inside a flow cytometer. Um, because when these particles are going through the laser in time, voltages are being generated. And these voltages are um, also, you have, you have here an example, but the voltages will look as a pulse 
that contains a height uh, value, which is the maximum amount of current output that reaches the detector. But we also have the width, which is the time that the particle will spend in this and the laser generating the balls, the area, which is the integration of the two of them. And then we have um, the threshold level, which you can see here in this uh, red line, um, which is the signal that is needed to allow for the flow cytometer to detect an event. So this is what is going to def define what is an event and what will stay unseen by the instrument in a way. Now, when we measure EVs, we have a situation uh, like you can see in this graph now, um, in which the particles, imagine particle one is an EV, don't really have a very high voltage signal as we are used to see for cells. And these signals are usually very close to background levels of the instrument, or maybe even overlapping with the background. And that also means that uh, wherever we decide to put our threshold is going to be extremely important. The threshold would be here um, illustrated with this blue line. You can see that now we will be able to detect an event for particle one, but don't account for all the background signals. But if we set up this threshold higher, then we might miss this uh, EV signal. And if we put it too low, then we will also get a lot of events from the background of the instrument. So this is a very important uh, factor to um, look up in your instruments, which threshold you're using for your measurements and which um, a signal you use to set up the threshold. Because conventional flow cytometry, I mentioned that is typically based on light scattering. And you can see here an example which with uh, 100 nanometer polystyrene beads and a 200 nanometer polystyrene bead population. We are using the threshold in the forward uh, parameter. And you can see how the beads and the background signals here are overlapping. Um, so now we can detect particles uh, depending on the amount of light scattering. Uh, we don't need to have a generic dye for the detection because it's just light scattering, but it can be very limited by the amount of background noise. The other alternative is to use fluorescence. These two bit populations are fluorescent, as you can see here in this plot. And when we use a fluorescence threshold that is represented with this line, you can see how we still detect background signals in this population, but they are separated from the population of the 100 nanometer bits. So meaning that we get better sensitivity for the detection of smaller particles when we use fluorescence-based detection. However, this uh, strategy really needs a generic dye that is sufficiently bright to uh, set up your threshold level um, and uh, you will be detecting only those particles that are fluorescent enough to the threshold. It is, however, less limited with the amount of background noise. So every strategy has their own pro and cons. And what I also want to stress here is that every uh, flow cytometer might have a different performance. And some might have a better light scatter based detection uh, and others better uh, fluorescence detection. Uh, so the best is to test your own instrument and uh, see for yourself what is the best way to detect EVs. Um, even though I mentioned that light scatter based detection is um, um, prone to have this background interference, it's also possible to reduce the uh, amount of uh, background signals that we detect. And that's something that we publish in this technical note 
in which we generated a matrix with different components that are very important for the detection of light scattering, which are in this case, the obscuration bar and the pinhole. We text tested different sizes and we found that increase in the size of the obscuration bar and decrease in the size of the pinhole allowed for uh, a better um, detection, more sensitive detection of EVs. You can see here how with the optimized configuration, we reduce a lot the background that we um, detected in these samples. And therefore we were able to lower the threshold level even more. And uh, we achieve a detection that was uh, uh, similar to that that we had with the fluorescence threshold. So there are improvements that can be done. Um, and this is one of the principles also that has been used in a newer generation of flow cytometers, uh, which is really great to see how the field is improving and we can optimize uh, instruments. Based on light scattering, there have also been a lot of efforts for a long time already uh, to standardize uh, measurements. And here you can see ar these articles uh, already from 2008 that were aiming to standardize uh, measurements uh, using calibration beads, what they called at the time. And these beads are polystyrene reference beads of different sizes, which were used for gating. And what I really want to uh, explain here is that there is a big difference in the refractive index of these polystyrene beads and the refractive index of EVs. And that means that the amount of light scattering of a bead of 500 nanometer is going to be a lot more than a 500 nanometer EV. And that's why you cannot directly compare sizes um, of EVs based on gates that you performed with these beads. You need to account for these differences in the refractive index and also differences in how the light might be collected. So there are advanced ways to standardize and calibrate instruments. Um, but just please be aware that when you use this type of beads and you're um, gating your samples in a way, you will be only looking at the large population of EVs. And this also illustrated that there was still quite a long way to go. Um, there are differences across technologies. We are very aware of these. There are a lot of uh, great articles comparing different uh, technologies. And what is very important is that every technology has different uh, uh, limit of detection and a different sensitivity. And that will also generate differences in the detected uh, vesicle sizes or vesicle concentrations. So what is becoming more and more important is to acknowledge this limit of detection for the technology and the platform that you use. And flow cytometry is not an exception to this. So if you can indicate and report uh, what is the minimum and the maximum that you're able to measure that really helps to make uh, results uh, more uh, reproducible and comparable. Um, what has been also reported uh, by other groups is that when the diameter of EVs uh, goes down, the concentration goes up. And if we think about the limit of detection, then we can imagine that uh, this is going to have a huge impact in the amount of EVs that we are reporting, because if you can detect 400 or you can detect 200, there is going to be a big difference. Uh, so there are studies also showing uh, a comparison uh, across many different flow cytometers, 46 in this case, in which uh, they uh, reported that most of the instruments were insensitive enough 
for the detection of even the largest population of EVs that they tested, and only a few instruments were sensitive enough to detect the smaller population of 300 nanometer EVs. So differences across technologies, differences across instruments, and then we realized we needed to have a, a framework for a standardized reporting of EV flow cytometry, which we called my flow site EV. It's published in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. And I, uh, yeah, it was a, a common effort from the uh, EV flow cytometry working group. Uh, there is a website where you can uh, find more information and more uh, videos, but I think this is a really great uh, publication, a landmark in EV flow cytometry. And it's actually an extension of the MyFlow site, which are guidelines for flow cytometry in general. And if you're working with flow cytometry, I cannot recommend more uh, for you to Google these two manuscripts and to get information on what are the things that you need to know um, and what are the things that you need to report. If you go to this uh, My Flow Site TV, you can find this figure in which we uh, try to assess all the different parameters that are really important to acknowledge. And we uh, also uh, gave a score for how important was it to perform or report uh, these, uh, these parameters. You can see how the first ones that are more related to sample preparation are extremely important and controls also very important. And then there are some um, advanced uh, calibration things that are still uh, quite important to report um, but maybe not, um, yeah, mandate, we cannot make them mandatory in a way. Um, and then lastly, also uh, sharing data, also quite important. Um, so there has also been a second manuscript as the, um, from the EV flow cytometry working group which is this uh, review article compendium of single EV flow cytometry experiments that contains a huge amount of information. You can see here the outline and just a disclaimer that is 70 pages long. But if you want to know more, um, I would also recommend you to go to this manuscript and read the section that you're most interested in. Uh, because it was a huge amount of uh, work uh, for all the members of the group to get this uh, publication out. And it's really great um, manuscript. Uh, going back to the MyFlowSite EV, you can find this figure with the seven categories that we think are very important to report about an EV flow cytometry experiment. And I would like to... Um, talk about some of them during this presentation. Um, first, focusing on assay controls, uh, which are very important to really prove that you have a single EV detection um, in your experiments. And uh, that also relates to when the particles are being uh, interrogated in the laser, then we know we will generate these forward side scatter signals and fluorescence, and we are able to detect with a fluorescent threshold or events in here. But what happens when we have a uh, higher concentration of samples, and this is also because EVs are very small in size, it could be that we are simultaneously detecting many of these particles in the interrogation spot at the same time. And then the instrument cannot um, distinguish between one EV or two EVs. So what is going to happen is that these signals will be integrated into one event. And that is also what we uh, call a swarm detection. You can see here how uh, the same sample in single EV or swarm detection looks completely different. You can also see visually that the event rate, so the number of events per second, 
uh, can go higher in your instrument. And the way to control for this is to simply dilute your sample. So whenever you measure EVs, make sure that you have different dilution points and that you're able to um, find um, reduction of the number of events with the increasing uh, dilution factor in your controls. And second, I also want to talk a bit about this uh, section on instrument calibration and data acquisition. I already explained to you the threshold, and now I want to explain a bit more about calibration and standardization because flow cytometers are designed to measure cell particle characteristics, but we usually um, use relative terms such as positive, negative, dim, bright. But what is negative, bright, uh, positive will differ between instruments and between laboratories. So there is a process of calibration, um, which is defined by the NIST, the National Institutes of, Institute of Standard and Technology, as the process of adjusting an instrument so that the analytical result is accurately expressed in some physical measure or a standardization which will acknowledge the measure of comparison for quantitative or qualitative value or something recognized as correct by common consent. And if we are able to perform this calibration and a standardization, then we will be able to better compare results across instruments and laboratories. So how we can uh, calibrate fluorescence? Uh, this is because there is a linear relationship between the amount of uh, photons and fluorescence that is being detected, but the data is processed and displayed in arbitrary units. And uh, uh, there are some calibration bits available that have uh, matching excitation and emission spectra of samples to be analyzed. And uh, when these calibrators are expressed in a meaningful fluorescent units, then we can use them for uh, this uh, calibration of uh, our instruments. So some um, beads that are available and also quite well known are the MESF, which stands for Molecules of Equivalent Soluble Fluorochrome Units. And they are surface dyed beads with a known number of fluorochromes relative to a solution. And then we will have different populations of these beads uh, from uh, dimmer to brighter and we can use them to calibrate the instrument. And how to do this is quite straightforward. We need to measure the beads on the instrument. And here you can see FITSI MESF beads of, with five different uh, populations. We will uh, be able to detect fluorescence, this is the MFI, in arbitrary units. And then we can uh, relate this MFI to the known FITSI MESF from the beads, perform a linear regression analysis. And with this linear regression, we can now express our uh, data in calibrated units of FITC MESF. So we have also um, done a, a collaborative study with uh, uh, the company BD Biosciences in which we evaluated two different sets of beads across different instruments. And here you can see uh, six micron and two micron beads that were measured on this influx cytoflex and serb celesta. And uh, the MFIs that we measured were very different for every instrument, as you can expect, uh, from 300 um, on the influx to 6,000 or 10,000 on the cytoflex. But since we knew the FITSI MESF value for every bit population, we could perform this linear regression analysis. And here you can actually see how in FITSI MESF, the values are now comparable across instruments. So this is very um, helpful. However, we also noticed that with the two different bit sets, uh, there were very small differences in the uh, linear regression uh, line, especially the slopes uh, here. And the EVs are very dim, dimmer than these beads. 
and they will fall in this position. So we investigated a little bit more what would be the impact of using different beads to calibrate EV data. And here you can see an unstained uh, EV control in which we are again using a fluorescent threshold. So we don't expect to detect events here. Uh, we have a, a CVC EV uh, sample. So you can see above the threshold now the events that we uh, stained and detected, and then with a CD9 PE antibody. And uh, this is the data in arbitrary units. But after running this calibration beads, we were able to report it in calibrated uh, ERF because we are actually not measuring uh, FITC MESF in this sample or PE MESF beads. And um, the variations introduced by this, uh, the, the use of one or the other bead set were actually quite um, surprising because in the same EV sample, we assigned either 370 or 660 ZFC ERF. Uh, but if you report your threshold level also in the standardized units, then you can account for these differences. So my advice would be to uh, use these calibration beads because you're going to facilitate a lot uh, inter-platform inter -platform comparison. Um, but also be aware that uh, uncertainty levels in these assigned um, calibrated values can also result in inaccuracies to the extrapolated values to EVs. And if you're doing a comparison study, then make sure that you have the same uh, calibrator sets and report this in your manuscripts very well. And now uh, another example that I would like to give you, and this one is uh, related to the detection of EVs in complex biofluids, in this, in this case, blood, um, blood plasma. And this is because we want to detect the EVs that are present in blood plasma because we know that they have specific signatures. But beside uh, EVs, there are also many other particles that have overlapping characteristics with EVs. And here you can see in this graph how lipoprotein particles uh, especially are incredibly abundant in, um, in blood plasma. And they have overlapping density and size. So this means that when we try to use either size-based or density-based isolation methods, uh, we will end up having co-isolated lipoprotein particles in our preparations. And yeah, the fact that they outnumber EVs is also uh, important to consider. So in this uh, research article, we actually uh, yeah, we wondered how the presence of low density lipoprotein particles would affect the detection of EVs uh, when you use single particle analysis techniques. And we use flow cytometry, but also other technologies. And uh, here we investigated uh, uh, chylomicrons, VLDLs, and LDLs. You can see here uh, electron microscopy pictures. We know chylomicrons are bigger, uh, VLDLs have a smaller size, and the LDLs are very small particle. We also looked for some uh, APOB markers that we know are present in there, and uh, also for some tetraspinins that we expect to detect on EVs. And we already detected uh, some CD9 signal in presence of the LDL commercial preparation which was uh, surprising, um, but also a very interesting finding. So we proceeded with the uh, detection of reference uh, mouse EVs by flow cytometry. And for that, I performed generic staining with a, with a lipophilic dye that will intercalate in the membrane. Then we perform a density gradient flotation and measure our samples on the uh, BD influx. And here you can see across the different fractions that we collected how um, the yeah, highest number of events really corresponded to the expected EV densities next to also procedural control. 
And when we look at the signals, you can see here the calibrated uh, fluorescent signals from the membrane and how buffer control showed very few events, the procedural control also, and then we were able to detect um, EVs above the threshold. Um, but also when looking at the size and forward scatter with the EVs, we had a very um, well-defined population here. And uh, this is another one of the controls that I mentioned, uh, serial dilution. So we also serially diluted this sample. We saw that the events went down with the dilution factor while the fluorescence intensity remained um, constant. And then we analyzed these uh, lipoprotein particles. So we did the same procedure. Uh, the difference here is that we detected most of the particles really in the lowest densities, as we were expecting for these lipoproteins. And here you can see the fluorescence. So we are able to stain them with the pKa 67 dye. And uh, above the threshold, we can detect uh, a lot of events, especially the LDLs that we know are very small, had a very low um, signals for the size and the forward scatter. And overall, we saw that these lipoprotein particles uh, also partially overlapped with the EVs, the reference EVs um, that we measured before. So next, we uh, performed some spiking experiments with these EVs and the EVs plus the lipoprotein particles. And you can see here across the densities. So these are more the EV expected densities and these are more the low densities from, for the lipoprotein particles. But you can see how in presence of the lipoprotein particles, we detected events um, uh, also mainly in the low densities, but also uh, in these ones. And we found that in presence of especially LDL, when we used the CD9 antibody that we were expecting to find back in the EV samples, uh, with the LDL sample, we still detected CD9 signals, but then at the low densities. So this was one of the reasons why we thought uh, that the EVs and the lipoproteins might be interacting and we, uh, did a lot more experiments and a lot more research in, in to um, also confirm um, these findings. Um, some considerations here, if you're doing a fluorescent thresholding for EV analysis is know uh, what your generic dyes are staining because it might not be EV specific. Um, and also um, be aware that other non-EV particles might influence your labeling efficiency, but also the EV analysis. So here also the idea um, that when these EVs are in presence of LDLs, they might also travel together to lower densities. And here you can also see uh, electron microscopy, a cryo EM picture of uh, an EV double, double membrane uh, surrounded uh, with LDL particles. And there is also a lot of um, uh, research being done at the moment on the presence of a protein corona and the fact that uh, live proteins are found uh, on EVs as part of this biomolecular corona, especially in plasma. So uh, we might think of lipoproteins are con as contaminations, but it might also be that they have a biological meaning and they are normally found in the um, corona of EVs. And last but not least, I also want to briefly mention something about data reporting, um, which is very important for reproducibility. And here you can see uh, actually, the my flow site EV, which is an Excel file, you can find this table online. And if you're doing EV flow cytometries, please make sure to uh, go to the manuscript, download the table, and fill it in when, with the details that you can report, because this will really help um, um, improve the field and the reproducibility. Um, it is also mentioned in the MICEF 2023 um, to refer to the MyFlowSideDB 
uh, framework and to ensure uh, correct calibration and uh, try to define upper and lower limits uh, of uh, your detection uh, system. And uh, lastly, also how to share flow cytometry data. Uh, there are some public repositories. Uh, this is a flow repository in which you can create an experiment and upload your FCS files. And that will generate a code that you can also use in your manuscript so that everyone can access your files. Um, and this is also a recent publication of the NanoFlow uh, repository that you can also um, uh, find online in this website and where you can also create an experiment and upload your files. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude that frameworks and guidelines uh, will support the development of single EV analysis methods for counting, sizing, and uh, EV cargo immunofluorescence, that proper reporting is critical to reproduce and correctly interpret results um, Calibrators and a standard can really facilitate comparisons over time and between labs. And lastly, that the biological matrix can impact the analysis of EVs, especially in complex biofluids. So uh, be aware that lipophilic dyes might also stain other particles that are not only EVs. Um, and also um, try to characterize your EV preparations as much as possible. Use orthogonal methods, not only flow cytometry, to know what is in there. Flow cytometry offers great prospects for high throughput multiparameter single EV analysis, but also as long as the fundamental principles and limitations of the instrument are not ignored and the experimental design is robust and reproducible. And with this, I would like to uh, quickly mention that if you're interested in uh, knowing more about uh, EV flow cytometry, there is a Coursera um, talk by Mark Bowen that is uh, available and also contains a lot of uh, information. There is also a YouTube channel from EV flow cytometry with more than 10 talks um, all about controls and uh, how to perform light scatter calibration and so on and so on. So these resources are open, available, and also uh, some great courses. I think this week there is one organized by the University of Virginia with a lot of experts in the field. So if you want to know more, um, I've seen that this one also has a virtual access. So look for these courses. There is also one uh, organized in Germany, in Heidelberg, and in which I also had the pleasure to participate as trainer. Uh, we also cover part of EV flow cytometry in it. So some really great uh, resources available for you to uh, learn more and reach out to people. Uh, with this, I would like to thank also to all the collaborators, the people that were part of this uh, research um, projects that I presented, and also you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions now. And if not, uh, you can also find me in the website of Utrecht University or email me with, uh, with uh, your questions. Thank you. So oh, thank you so much, Stefan. It was a really nice talk, very basics of flow cytometry, moving through how adapting flow cytometry can be useful for, useful for the EV field. And of course, the standardization that I think is really amazing uh, that you show the papers and where do we need to go to check and to work as we are supposed to, to, to work with the EVs, which is really important in the future. Amazing talk. Uh, I, I might have a couple of questions, I will open the session uh, for, for the participants. And I'm seeing here in the chat box, uh, Sara Vega, please, if you would like, unmute yourself and ask your question directly to Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Great talk. Really nice having you collaborating with SNEV again. Uh, I have two questions. You can answer both or then pass to another person. Uh, but uh, my first question is, what controls do you recommend to always be present in a flow experiment with EVs? And if you if you used any control for the pH 
PKH 76, um, 67 die. Uh, because um, I know that it can form like my cells, even if you're not working with blood or plasma, even if it's cell conditioned media, just putting the dye in it can create these my cells. And if you have any like food control for this, Yes. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much uh, for your kind words. It's also uh, great for me to be involved with SNF again. Um, and also great questions. So I'm trying to go back here to one of my slides, actually, this one with the SA controls. Um, because the one I also um, explained today a bit more in detail is the serial dilutions, which I think is very important to make sure that you're detecting uh, single EVs and not doing swarm detection. But you can also see here buffer only control. And this can be just the buffer that you're using in your experiments. And I always measure this control in my, uh, in my experiments as well. Um, and then the buffer with reagents. So if you're using antibodies, we also know antibodies can uh, form aggregates and those aggregates can have a similar size to your EVs. So having this buffer with reagents control is also extremely important. Um, unstained controls can also be very informative and um, this procedural control is the one that I also measured, now uh, going back to your second question about the PK-67 dye, because the procedural control is meant to be the um, perfect control to see if in your um, uh, staining um, method, including any uh, processing steps that you might have, your dyes or your antibodies are generating this kind of micelles. And yes, we measured this uh, procedural control. I think it was in the second part of my talk, what I showed here, um, that the procedural control was very similar to the buffer only control. And it's true that these lipophilic dyes can be a bit difficult to work with, but we also did a lot of research in our group. And that is what we are very careful with them. And we do a density gradient um, post staining purification before we measure on the flow cytometer, because with the density gradient, the unbound dye will remain in the bottom of your gradient and the uh, EVs that are stained are the ones that will float to the densities. So if you measure, um, yeah, so if you measure the EV densities, then you're going to see um, the this staining and having the procedural control next to your stain EVs is going to tell you if you might have artifacts in there or not. And I can also tell you that if you don't do this density gradient step, then you have a lot more uh, background in the in the samples. Thank you. That's great because I was actually I thought that you did the density gradient for that reason to get rid of the dye. But then I was also wondering if you could have my cells of the same density of EVs. But I guess that if you see it very clear, it's because it's really all removed, which is really nice to know because usually people just tend to wash it with a TBS, like through a column or something. And uh, yeah, this is a better way to get rid of it. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. We can move forward to the next one. So Pragati, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Estefania, for your great talk. Uh, I was wondering, have you ever managed to identify different EV subsets based on the surface marker and not just size? And surface markers, I would mean like 63 being specific to specific EV subtype or CD9 or 81, so on and so forth. Yes, uh, I've seen um, that there are different types of EVs that have different uh, expression amounts of, of, of the tetraspanins, uh, for example, the three ones that you have mentioned, uh, three, CD9, 63 and 81 are a go-to. Um, and I've seen, uh, for instance, with uh, breast cancer cell lines, um, different ones that they have different expression levels of these tetraspanins as well. Um, but with uh, EVs, it's also quite difficult to see separate populations like we are used to see with cells. So it's mostly uh, higher or lower expression. 
um, but there are different, definitely differences in different protein expressions across EV samples, yes. All right, thanks. Thank you, Pragati. So the next question in the chat box, and I believe is the, the last one, is from Carlos P. Are you there? Carlos, are you there? Yeah. Maybe I will ask the question. Um, so he's asking if uh, if he understood well. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the kit available um, in the market using BIT is for the, the detecting EVs. It's only to see big EVs, not the smaller ones. Can you clarify on this? Um, yeah, so you mean the polystyrene beads that I mentioned for the gating? I guess. Yeah, uh, I would say so, yeah. Yes, so um, the, the problem, so what I explained is that these beads have a refractive index that is much higher than the refractive index of EVs. Mm -hmm. So when you use beads that are 200 nanometer in size, you cannot compare that to a 200 nanometer EV. So by using these beads, you will always see a higher size for EVs unless you perform a full light scattering calibration and you account for the difference in the refractive index as well. And um, there are some smaller beads that are also available and other materials such as silica. The silica has a refractive index that is closer to the one of EVs. So there's also the less scattering light. So those are a bit better to compare with EVs, but there are still beads um, they are synthetic and uh, they are very different from EVs. So just be aware of the differences. Okay. Uh, I hope that uh, Stephanie could answer your question, Carlos. Otherwise, okay. Yeah, he replied. Um, I don't see any other question in the meanwhile. If anyone wants to, to ask a question, just raise the hand or post it in, in the chat. And I will ask a quick question if you don't mind, Stephanie. So imagine if the ability to buy uh, like the nano FCM, for instance, that uh, it's, a, it's a commercially available uh, flow cytometer for EVs, I believe, or to buy one of the, uh, of the, one of the ones that you showed in the list, which one will you, will you focus on or, and why? The nano FCM or the other option, like the standard um, meter with the adaptations that you show? Yeah, I think um, it depends on what is your research question. Um, so every instrument has its own possibilities and limitations, and you need to decide for yourself what you need to, to know. Like the Nano FCM, I think it's a very sensitive instrument, um, but uh, the flow rate is also um lower than the one of a conventional instrument so if you have to work with clinical samples um yeah then that's something to to take into account and mm -hmm. uh you put me a bit in the spotlight now <laughs> mm -hmm. uh i'm not being paid by any company so and i'm not gonna say to buy one or the other yeah sure i have tested a lot of instruments and what i can really say is uh, that the controls are very important and that you need to characterize your instrument as well and uh, be very careful when you report the data Sounds good. And I don't see any other question, just a uh, last one. Um, it's more like one about the future of the field. How do you envision like the spectral flow cytometers uh, could be used for the EVs? Do you think it's uh, it's a good approach? How do I, I, I honestly, I don't know if they are being used or not already. Yes, yeah, I think the the field is uh, developing a lot, uh, the field of EV flow cytometry. And I see more and more instruments now that are available with a small particle detectors. 
And I think the, the work that we have also published from the EV flow cytometry working group is also making the difference, you know, the framework, uh, how to report the data, which controls you need to make sure that you have in your experiments. So I can see um, that this is going to become, it's already one of the most used techniques for EV catheterization. And I think it's going to become a very important one in the future as well. And uh, hopefully with more calibration, uh, with uh, more standardization and mm -hmm. uh, with people using these repositories and reporting the data so that we can compare and make sure that there is a smooth uh, clinical translation of EVs as well. Okay. Thank you so much for, for answering. You're very right. um, welcome. Yeah, I don't see any other questions in the chat neither someone raising the hand i think we closed the session and it was a, again stephanie it was a really really nice talk and i think a lot of people will use the information that you show uh, for their phds or research i believe and thank you once again for everything thank you so much for having me have a wonderful rest of your day yeah, you too bye bye, bye.